I really enjoyed the ease with which the signal went in and the fact that it just worked without needing any difficult setting up. And this really goes a long way to add operational interest to your model railway. Hi there everyone, I really hope I find you well and it's really great to see you back here on the channel. I'm Jennifer Kirk, welcoming you up here to the loft on Weir Yard. And today we've got a little project on and it's something that we touched on in a video a little while back when we started adding some working semaphore signals. Now I've tried a few different methods of doing this and the one which I found the easiest was the Daypole signals. But there was a few points on that particular version which I wasn't quite certain about. The fact that you couldn't actually pick an aspect, you could merely change it to the next aspect. And even though we did manage to wire it into track detection circuits, which is really, really good, I still needed that push button just for when it got out of sync. And it did sometimes do that. But Daypol have very kindly sent over an example of one of their new bracket signals. And the one that they've sent over is actually the GWR junction signal. And they do several different versions of these. And they seem to be working in a very different way. And I was really intrigued to see just how much easier this makes the installation. Now, as anybody knows who's tackled things like the ratio signal kits, yes, with some great deal of care, you can get some really nice prototypical models, but it does take a very steady hand, and painting is often the key. It's one thing to build a lovely model, but it's make or break with the paint finish that you can apply to it, and some of those parts really are quite fiddly. Now, I have seen some people manage to get those signals to work, and indeed we did do a video using the DCC Concepts Cobalt SS stepper motors and did successfully get one of the ratio signals to work and be switchable. But all of these different methods are fraught with problems and I think for the casual modeler, they do become quite a daunting project. And that's why, with great thanks to Daypol, today I'm gonna to be showing you the really easy, hassle-free way of installing fully functional semaphore signals to your layout that can be interlocked with the point work with the greatest of ease. So come with me in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts, and with additional support from PD Models, makers of an amazing range of 3D printed models and kits, and a whole host of detailing parts to really make your modeling projects something really special. And let's take a look at just what we can do with this all new Daypol servo operated signal. Today's project video is going to be fitting this servo operated signal, which has very, very kindly been provided by Daypol for review. And this is something which I know that some of you have been sharing some amazing pictures on the Jenny Monday Club Facebook group about um, some really quite special signals. And I, I do feel quite inadequate when I look at those and compare them to some of my rather lackluster uh, ratio offerings that I tried to build over the years. One thing that I've always struggled doing is getting them to work. Now, a few I did, but it really was a struggle. And I found that more often than not, I just couldn't get signal kits to work adequately. Now, this is an area where Daypol brought to the market their uh, uh, remote operated signals, and they've done really well. We've had a review and fitting guide for one of the previous batch of models. But I know that some people have said that uh, the fact that you couldn't set those to a particular aspect, it was really a case of press the button and they would change to the next aspect. And people found that you couldn't interlock them easily with the point work. And it seems that Daypol have listened to that feedback. And what we've got here 
is the new bracket signal, but it's servo operated and actually is positionable such that you can actually pick the aspect that the signal shows. And that got me thinking. And I thought that maybe if instead of using the enclosed switches, if we used something like say the frog switching from one of the accessory decoders that is currently powering the points, I think it's going to be possible to interlock this signal with the points, so no extra levers required, and the signal will always show the correct aspect to match the points. And I'm really also looking forward to seeing what Daypol have changed with the design of these signals and taken on board the feedback from the first batch. And it looks to me like actually we've got something really quite special here. These come in a quite standard Daypol packaging. So we've got 4L-001-005, and this is the junction signal GWR right hand with two arms, shorter post to right. Uh, they also do shorter post to left, and then they do the bracket signal to the left and to the right. Now, just for those of you who aren't in the know, essentially this would be for a junction. So where you've got a point and two routes, and the idea is that the taller post is always the prominent route. So that's the main route, that would be the main line, and then the line that splits off it would be demarked by the lower signal. And um, again, if you've got the split to the left, you would use the junction with the lower post to the left that Daypol do offer. If you just had the uh, bracket signal, so it's a single arm on a bracket, these tend to be more about sighting. So somewhere where if you just had the straight up post, it wouldn't be clearly visible to the driver, then you can have the bracket just to move the signal arm over and just make things a little bit clearer for seeing what's coming ahead on the route. Opening this up, let's just uh, take a look inside. It comes in uh, plastic blister packaging and we do have some comprehensive instructions as well and um, when I was looking at these what is interesting is that these are a big change, a big step change from the previous signals. Now they do operate the same form factor, they've got a similar method for attaching them into the baseball, which actually I found really, really easy when I did the full install of that uh, single post signal. But these take it one step further with the servo actuation. There's actually a separate box that has all of your electronics in, and the signal itself is just from spring-loaded push rods. So I'll just take the lid off that. And we get two sets of uh, the switches that would be for one aspect changed to the other aspect. And these are three wire. So we've done away with the two wire system that was on the previous batch of signals. And I really do prefer the idea of this. And of course, it does open up that possibility of being able to interlock these to the points using, well, in my case, I've got um, DCC Concepts ADS units that have inbuilt uh, frog polarity switches. And I'm going to have a look at trying to use those to interlock with the points. Um, but you can also use use the uh, supplied switches which just mount into your fascia, you just drill the hole and put them in, screw in the bezel. Um, but also it does mean that for example you could use a relay to be able to switch these and even a Pico PL13 or PL15 type micro switch would also allow the facilitation to switch the aspect on the signal. And these plug for switch one is for the main signal there switch two for the bracket and these again completely solder free really easy when you're working underneath the baseboard they can only go in one way round and that is a good positive attachment it's clearly quite different from the previous iteration of the signals and we've got these little push rods and if i push on these i can actually change the signal really quite readily Everything that's in this signal is purely mechanical, um, although we do have, for the LED lights, you can see there we've just got so three uh, little flat contact pieces in the circuit board. 
they then mesh with the three contacts in here so there's no soldering required which I really do like and then the signal itself we match up the yellow to the yellow and these just very carefully just slot into place and of course you would do this once it is in the underside of the layout now we very carefully just click that in and this is now all held together and it's actually pretty secure so uh, I was initially worried that this box uh, there was nothing to secure it but actually I don't think that's going to be a problem these two wires are for power and as the instructions say between 9 volts and 12 volts DC or 14 volts AC and it can also be powered by DCC track voltage up to 18 volts and if you're running them on DC red is positive black is minus and obviously AC it doesn't really matter now I'm tempted actually to run this off the DCC track bus and what it means is that you can get a remote installation of this without any bother with having to run wires back to your control panel because you can just have these uh, mounted in the fascia right by the signal drawing its power from that track bus we also have um, some fine tuning on the bottom if required and we've also got the resets uh, just in case you need to reset the signal now what I'm going to be doing is showing you the full installation of this and uh, it really couldn't be simpler effectively all we need to do is to drill that hole where we want the signal, mount the signal and then push the, the servo unit underneath. On the other side of the instructions we've got some really handy clear instructions on different alternatives for how you can wire your signal. And it's got me thinking that we can actually interlock this with the points just by using the frog outputs either from something like the DCC Concepts ADS S to X units uh, and that's a really great way to just with it no effort whatsoever make sure that these signals change always to match the points. When it comes to mounting this into the baseboard it's really easy. We're going to need a well it talks about a 15 mil hole and I'm going to use a spade drill but um, I'm thinking that I don't know maybe 16 mil and it'd be a little bit loose or alternatively I've got a 12 mil drill bit and then it's just a case of filing the hole out so um, we'll see which works when I come to install this but certainly there's lots of possibilities and I'm really looking forward to fitting this to weir yard so first things first I want to pick a suitable location where the signal can be seen most likely to replace a non-working ratio model and I've got several of these around I've not had a huge amount of luck with making them function remotely they do seem to be quite brittle and it's something with these that these are very very robust so there's no real risk of uh, even with the smallest of knocks having bits flying around and even the ladders are really nicely put together when it comes to sighting I've decided to replace this ratio signal it's suffered a few knocks and I won't miss it if it gets replaced with something that actually works and what I can do is once this is levered off I will drill the hole in approximately the same place as this has been and uh, then we can just really quite quickly get to work on fitting the signal installation of the signal actually couldn't be easier and I found it easier than the first run of these signals. We have actually fitted one to Weir Yard. And whilst that was fairly straightforward, this was even more easy. So uh, I can highly recommend this. Of course, we're retrofitting this to a fully scenic layout. It wasn't really too difficult. I just uh, carefully wetted just to soften the ballast in the area where I wanted the signal to go then scraped it back to bare baseboard and that then allowed a good clean drill with a spade drill bit just to make the hole to slide the signal down into. 
and that really couldn't have been more straightforward. It um, would just go straight in really easy and then the plastic nut underneath screws back up just to secure everything in place. You don't have to go gung-ho with that, I didn't need any tools, just hand tight was more than adequate and uh, the signal just feels really nice and firmly in place, it's good and steady and that uh, large base on it just makes sure that uh, there's no uh, worries about it uh, being at a slanty angle and it does make it very robust. Because the mechanism on these new signals is contained in that clip-on base and that contains all of the servo mechanism, it really does mean that you can install these with confidence because in the very unlikely event that there's a problem, you can just unclip that mechanism from the bottom and uh, the signal itself you just leave in situ and I think that that is probably something that a lot of people would appreciate because it also means that you can take that module out from underneath the baseboard to be able to work on it to do the wiring and the plug-in connectors mean that there's absolutely no soldering required at all in one of these installations. If you were installing this clean from scratch on a new build layout, I'd recommend getting them all in place before you do the ballasting. And then it's a simple task to just very, very cleanly ballast around the base. Just make sure that you don't gum up where the wires go through, but just bed it in and it really will look the part. On a retrofit, such as what I've done here, it's still quite easy to just fill in around the signal. I chose not to use ballast because of the difficulty in matching completely new ballast to the weathered ballast that's already here on the layout. So instead, I used some War World Scenics basing glue and then a little bit of static grass and scatter from the War World Scenics range. And that's just made sure that there's no ugly scar where the uh, signal has uh, been bedded in. In terms of wiring, I just found it really, really simple. You can plug in those uh, switches that come in the package and that uh, is an easy way of getting these working. If you just drill out in your fascia, you can mount those quite neatly close by to the signal. If you need to extend them, it's quite easy to just solder in an extra length of wire and use something like heat shrink tubing just to make sure that there's no risk of shorting. I actually chose to use some spare Hornby 00 D3 signal levers and these are the on-on type, so they mimic what the uh, switches that come with the signal do, but these had the added bonus that it was quite easy to mount them underneath the baseboard. Now this is just a temporary installation for me because I do have plans to interlock these with the points, and this is another area that this new development in the Daypole signals really does make even more easy. With the previous version, you effectively just uh, shorted out two wires using a push to make switch, and that would change the signal to the next aspect. So it was very easy for the signal to actually go out of sync with the points. With these, because it's a positive three wire switch, it will always change to the direction that you tell it to. And that opens up some amazing possibilities to wire it back into a frog polarity switch, uh, which you don't want to send any power to the signal because that will damage the electronics. But essentially, you're just having the uh, polarity changing frog switch uh, acting as that on-on switch. And uh, any number of modules will allow you to do this. Indeed, Daypol sell their own two-channel uh, decoder which is designed for them by Traintech specifically for operating these signals. You can also use something like the frog polarity switching on a DCC concept ADS unit or indeed one of their Cobalt SS units too have the really handy switches that let you just wire them in and interlock them direct to your points. When it comes to setting up the signal, I actually found that it worked out of the box flawlessly. I didn't really need to play about with it too much. The instructions though are really, really clear. Effectively, all we need to do is to look on the underside and we've got a picture up on screen that uh, just helps you out. And this is taken straight from the clear instructions. Hole 1A and 2A 
They lead down to a little uh, tiny push button on the circuit board inside and it's really easy to use a small jeweler's screwdriver to gently press on that button and believe me you don't need to apply any great force you'll just feel a sort of click and then once you've done that the light on the signal will start to flash you can then move the flathead jeweler's screwdriver over to the corresponding fine tuning trim pots and I actually found that I just didn't need to mess about with this. But if for whatever reason you're finding that the signal doesn't quite have the amount of travel that you're looking for, you can adjust it with these. Once you're happy with that, go back, put the jeweler's screwdriver into the corresponding hole, down to that little push switch, and just press and hold for three seconds and then you'll find that the uh, light on the signal stops flashing and it is set. If you do find that you've um, messed everything up and it's not doing anything that you want, you can't get it back to factory defaults, then there's an easy reset. Holes 2C and 1C allow you to reset each of the two signal mechanisms and you just push down inside the hole and you'll find a similar little push button and that allows you to reset it to factory default. And it's as simple as that. The power for this signal I've just drawn direct from the DCC bus. But uh, you can power it from a DC voltage, so it's still suitable for those modelers who have not moved over to DCC. Each of the two channels works completely independently from each other, although it would be perfectly easy to crosswire them to the same switch so that they would always show the opposite aspect from each other. And that might be useful if you're wanting to interlock them to a single point at a junction. With this, I can operate the right hand route, and I really do like that prototypical bounce that uh, Daypol have managed to program into the servo unit. And again, if we go to the left hand post, we have exactly the same. And it's a really pleasing motion on the signal. We've also got the aspect always correctly shown. And this really goes a long way to add operational interest to your model railway. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video as much as I enjoyed making it. And actually, it was a really fulfilling installation. I really enjoyed the ease with which the signal went in and the fact that it just worked without needing any difficult setting up. There was no soldering involved. And I know that for a lot of people, the mere mention of soldering is like some kind of magic voodoo. And we have to sacrifice fresh virgin's blood and do a gang sign on a blue moon just to make everything work. But there was none of that with this installation. In terms of cost, well, we've got an affiliate link in the description box down below, and that takes you to where you can pick these signals up for around the £58 mark. Now, there isn't really any variance between either going for the bracket signal or the junction signal, and both of them do have their uses on the railway, as we've mentioned in this review. And particularly, you've got the uh, junction signal with the lower dolly to the right or lower to the left, and that's to do with the routes and how they split. So basically the main route is always the higher signal on the post. The bracket signals as well are really down to improved sighting. So if you've got a signal that you want to put in, say, on a curve, then that's where you might want to consider mounting the bracket signal. Either way, these are a really great addition to the Daypole range. And mixed in with some of the other signals in their range, they really do look great. They were incredibly robust too. And I managed to knock this example whilst cleaning the track after I'd done the static grass, just to get that static grass glue off the rails. And normally if you uh, hit a ratio signal, then you just end up with bits of plastic flying off into the scenery. And they can be quite infuriating when you're really trying to be careful around them and just one touch and things like the ladders fall off. There was none of that problem with this Daypole kit. So really, really pleased with it. And I'd like to extend thanks to Daypole for sending this uh, example over to allow me to really put it through its paces. 
If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to tickle that like button and do please consider sharing it because sharing is caring and you can also subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell to be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. And we've also got lots of great merch in the uh, description box down below. You can check out our range of hoodies, t-shirts, die cut stickers, mugs. There's even my science fiction books. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Coates, saying you take great care of yourself. I look forward to seeing you then. Happy modelling. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. Today's video also comes with the support of PD Models, makers of a whole range of 3D printed kits and accessory detailing that brings something special to your model layout. Available in a number of different scales and gauges, this range is sure to have something for you, so check them out at the affiliate link down below to see what they have got today to make your model layout something special. PD models are also well known for their museum quality models that can be made bespoke to order. So do contact them if you have some specific requirements and see if they can do something special for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, OORail.co.uk, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink. Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grantline Products, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYMRish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Graham Foster, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 class, Ian Coulson, and Alan Dickerson. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.